Hello once again audience, it is me, your boy, TPT, coming at you, not live and not from Twitch TV, so I hope you all having a fantastic day today. I am joining you for yet another EU4 advanced guide. So today we will be looking at favours and we will also be looking at, of course, the wonderful aggressive expansion. Yes, you guys love aggressive expansion, don't you? It's a, a beautiful sight, if you ask me. You know, really, really appreciate it. Um, what, what, what game of E4 would be complete without at least one coalition? Am I right? But, before we get into that, of course, I do just have to quickly give a shout out to the E4 Casuals and E4 Australia Discord. Obviously, E4 Casuals is designed for North Americans and Europeans, whereas E4 Australia focuses more on the Australians. They're both really good, active places. Um, and as long as you avoid the politics channel, you should probably be okay. Um, so, obviously, we're just going to dive straight into it. So, first of all, we will be discussing the aggressive expansion. Um the aggressive expansion are uh, and how coalitions function essentially so in order for a coalition to form there has to be a certain number of requirements uh, to be met um, now first of all what I actually do is I'm going to co uh, cover ways to minimize the aggressive expansion impact that you get so there's there's two ways to minimize aggressive expansion the first one is to reduce it before it happens and the second one is to reduce it quicker after it happens so the first one can be done by getting the quite simple buff it's just called aggressive expansion impact minus 10 uh minus x y z percent uh and you can obviously get it in a few different ways you've got one uh, over here of course uh you can also get it for example in missions uh and uh, one that i recently took uh espionage negative 20 percent there uh plus i believe some nations do have it in their ideas uh on oh, their mind looks like brandenburg doesn't have it anymore they used to though uh maybe it's prussian ideas that i'm thinking of now uh because they they did give brandenburg their own ideas um a little while back uh but yeah so there's a few different ways obviously of reducing it straight away um prior to it occurring and the way that you reduce it faster after it occurs is by getting improved relations uh, this can be done through a variety of means, uh, including royal marriages, advisors. Um, there are also, I believe there's an idea or two for it. Yep, there it is. Uh, diplomatic ideas, um, as well as, once again, events and various other means as well. Uh, if we go look down here, I don't think we have it uh, unlocked yet. But, um, th so those are the two main ways that you can decrease aggressive expansion before and after it occurs. Hey guys, just uh, jumping in here with a quick edit, because um, I realized that I forgot to talk about it in the original video. However, when factoring in aggressive expansion, there are also a number of natural factors um, that you need to consider when you are taking land. It's also one of, for example, it's, it's why the HRE has so much uh, aggressive expansion in it. Um, and so that is essentially uh, first of all, you got religion. If uh, a country has the same religion as the country which you've just taken land from, there's an additional 50% aggressive expansion. Uh, there's It's 0% if they're different, but in the same religious group. So, for example, if they're Catholic versus... Um, uh, Catholic versus Reformed, um, and then it's negative 50% if there are different religious groups. So, Catholic versus Sunni, for example. And there's also an infidel conquest modifier, uh, which is if you are a different religion from the person that you're eating, um, then someone will have get a 50% more um, if the target country is the same as the country that you just ate uh, and the state religion of you is different uh, from those countries. Um, there's also a culture modifier of 50%. So if this, the primary cultures are the same, uh, then it's 50%. If it's their different cultures, but the same group, so say, for example, Scottish versus English, then it's 25%, and it's 0% if they're unrelated. Um, there's also an additional 50% for HRE modifiers. Um, so if the conquered province and the target country are part of the HRE, it's an additional 50%. Um, and there's also the distance. 
Um, so the distance is basically the in-game distance. Um, it it, uh, it determines it based on that. Um, although that's uh, so obviously people who are closer to you will suffer a lot more aggress expansion than people who are further away. Um, uh, also, uh, if they're allied, they'll only get about two thirds of the uh, of the top of the aggressive expansion they normally would. Otherwise, they'll get the full amount, of course. Um, and if they're a subject nation, they only get ten percent of the aggressive expansion. Um, and 100% obviously if they're not a subject. So I just want to put that in guys and continue back through the normal video. Now we obviously get to the important part about coalitions. So there has to be a number of conditions fulfilled in order for a coalition to form. First of all, the key number is 50 aggressive expansion. 49.9 uh, aggressive expansion, you're fine. 49.8 aggressive expansion, you're fine. 50 aggressive expansion, that's when it starts becoming a problem because 50 aggressive expansion is the minimum amount of aggressive expansion that someone has to have against a target country in order to be able to form a coalition. So, for example, let's just say I no CB Aragon. Okay, we get no, uh, oh, can I not do that? All right, no, I can't. I have to wait for the first month. Um, well, I'll do that. I'll just explain. The next important thing, so uh, the country has to have a negative opinion, that, that being below zero. If, you, if the country has an opinion above zero, uh, then you they will not join the coalition. That's very important because it means that you can avoid coalitions even with the 50 uh, aggressive expansion cap um, due to the country liking you. So if I was to do this, say for example, then you'll see all of these countries, all these countries with uh, aggressive expansion above 50. Oh, and look at that. We're already getting a coalition. And it's going to be a big one too. Because <laughs> that is a lot of aggressive expansion right there. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so that brings us on to one of our next points. The coalition has to actually pose a threat to the target of the coalition. If you are immensely stronger than any other neighboring ally, uh, neighboring enemy, uh, and any potential coalition member, they will not form a coalition. And in fact, if they believe they no longer pose a threat to you, they will also leave the coalition as well. Now, in, um, another fact of you being able to join the coalition is obviously you can't have a truce. Uh, you can't be an ally or a subject of the target nation. Uh, and also you have to have either a rivalry or an outraged attitude. Now, typically outraged occurs at 50 gross expansion with a negative opinion. So it does sort of tie into that below zero. Um, but I, uh, you know, sometimes it is a little bit, the, the attitudes are a little bit funky. Uh, and, and because of that, you know, they can, they can, you know, be a little bit, bit misleading where someone you think they should be fine, but they're not. Um, often what will happen is if you reload the game, the AI does tend to typically update their attitudes. That's why it's important that if you're about to face a coalition, it may be a good idea not to, to close the game and have to open it back up because that could be a problem for you. <laughs> so you got to be sort of careful about those sort of things. Um, there are also uh, a few other things you need to note about coalitions. So with coalitions, uh, a very important thing to note is you can't separate piece a member of a coalition. You have to piece out the war leader. So that's very important because it means you can often be facing significantly higher numbers than you're prepared for and you can't piece them out. And that's a big problem because they coalitions will tear you a new one if you're not careful i'm hoping they declare warn me so i can show it i mean there's enough of them so um yeah so it's it's quite important to know now another good idea uh is essentially uh called truce juggling uh in which you actually make the most of the coalition by essentially juggling the truces of nearby neighboring countries. So, for example, um, as I mentioned, if a coalition doesn't see itself as capable of posing a threat to the target, they will not join the coalition. Now, this is important because 
say for example, if you saw who who joined the coalition, okay, it started off with like you know like uh, Switzerland or whatever, then got onto Castile. Now say as soon as Castile declared the coalition, I declared war on Castile. Oh, sorry, as soon as they joined the coalition, I declared war on Castile. And then, if Castile was the only major player in the coalition after me declaring on them, then most likely what would happen is once I pieced out with Castile and that coalition, the rest of the coalition would disband. Obviously, this wouldn't be the case for this particular one because I'd still have to worry about Burgundy and England, and in fact, I'd most likely be facing two coalition wars, which can occur. You can have two coalition wars occur at the same time if a coalition war is declared quite quickly. Uh, and more people join up following that cold, um, like following that war being declared, they will instead join a separate coalition, uh, which can also declare war on you. So you have to be careful of that. You can end up in multiple coalition wars, which can really mess you over if you're not careful. Uh, because obviously you're looking at closer to a 200% peace deal instead of a 100% one if you if you lose. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so yeah, so you really you really got to sort of be careful about that. My my advice is I typically try to avoid going over 50 as much as possible in the early game. But once I get to around the mid to late game, typically it doesn't really matter as much because I'm going to be having a lot stronger country. And they often find themselves not uh, not thinking that they can pose a threat to me. And often you'll see even if a coalition does form, it'll disband quite quickly afterwards. Now, the next important system is the new one. Well, it's an adaptation of an existing system which was uh, given a, not necessarily an overhaul, but a very significant update uh, in the latest Leviathan DLC update, which is the Favors. Um, so can I just first of all say that this new Favors system is extremely powerful, uh, particularly if you're looking at this one here, Request Relative as Air. So essentially, you can pay 90 favors to get a very, very high chance of getting a PU with any country of your choosing. So realistically, if I wanted to, I could just, you know, if I hadn't obviously ruined my country, I could just sit around here, do what I usually do, save up favors on France, and then boom, look at that, they got my heir on the throne, now I got a good chance of PUing them. I personally think that that is just disgustingly broken. That just seems way, way too overpowered for me. On top of that, another example is 10 favors for 2,274 soldiers. So typically, if you exclude the natural rate uh, at which we gain favors, um, so we're currently getting 0 0.41 favors per month. So if you're looking at this way, okay, so if you get 2274 soldiers divided by 10, which means that you're getting 227.4 soldiers per favor. Now, in order to get one favor, you obviously need to, um, you know, you need to, you need to be carrying the favors. And so that means you're getting 0 0.4. And so you're getting 0.41% of those 200 and 74 soldiers. So essentially, just by currying favors, you're essentially getting a free extra 100 manpower a month off of France um, just for using a diplomat. Which So you're almost doubling your max manpower, uh, manpower recovery, sorry, um, just by currying favors. If we look at it, another example is ducats. Once again, ducats, 106 ducats. We divide that by 10. And then once it also multiplied by 0 0.41, essentially, look at that. That's another four ducats a month. That is 80% of our income that we could be getting just for currying favors with France. Similar story with soldiers. Um, you can get the general idea. Um, and obviously, you can still use them to prepare for war. Uh, you can still use them to call them in for war. If you see here, you know, you can use obviously that as standard. Um, and naturally, you also have the extremely powerful option of... Uh, requesting them relative as air. Now, to be fair, obviously, you do have to consider that it does take quite a while to get that. Uh, realistically, if you're carrying favors at a rate of uh, 0 0.4 um, per, uh, per that, uh, what, sorry, per, per month, it would take about 18 years in order to gain that many favors. But that's essentially a guaranteed same dynasty on their throne in 18 years, alright? 
That's, that is, that is seriously busted, because in 18 years' time, hell, if you're playing good enough, in 18 years' time, you could practically contest that union already. So, it's just, okay, maybe that's a little, a bit of an exaggeration, unless you're like Flory Worry. Probably would still be a little hard at that point. But in 18 years' time, you've already got your, you've got a guaranteed, guaranteed same dynasty on their throne, which means that you can take your time. And when you're ready, deck on them and take that shit. It's just, it just feels extremely powerful to me right now. Um, and most likely this will end up getting nerfed. Um, if it doesn't get nerfed, uh, I mean, frankly, frankly, the fact that this got even introduced to me, the, the game in the first place, really makes me wonder if the person that plays EU4, uh, that, that actually, um, like, in, like brought in the system actually plays EU4, like if it's actually play tested this, because... Again, you're getting what eighty percent of your income a month just for using a diplomat. You're getting you're almost doubling your um your, your soldier supply. You're getting about eighty percent of that too, if you're real um well, well you can choose one or the other. Sorry, not not two. That's my apologies. That's a bit of a slip of speech. Or you can get your goddamn heir on their throne, which frankly used to be very quite difficult. Not not extremely difficult, but quite difficult to do. Um, so uh, and also. Currying favors is easier and quicker if you have high diplomatic reputation. So just think how OP playing as Austria is going to be when you're rocking like, you know, like 10 diplomatic reputation and you're just currying favors with everybody and you suddenly get like six PUs in 20 years. You know, it's, it's going to be absolutely broken. It just, it really feels like it's going to need a nerf. And it feels like it's definitely going to get one if they pay any attention to feedback from the player base. Because I'm not the only person that thinks this, and I'm not the only person that knows it. Uh, so look, that's 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 enough of my uh, my personal thoughts on it as well. Uh, I do hope you guys have enjoyed this guide. Of course, I will be releasing uh, a couple more uh, with specifically Leviathan related content. Um, because there is quite a bit extra to cover now, which I am very thankful for. Because I always. Um, you know, it's always nice to have things that I know that I can make YouTube videos out of. It means that I know that I can provide content to you guys consistently. Because um, I do try and upload at least once every five days. Normally, more often, uh, if I can think of more things to do. Um, but obviously, I'm also quite busy with university and work in that. That takes up about four day full days, uh, normally more, of, of, of my week. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys have enjoyed. And I will see you all next time. Peace.